Fiat 2000. The Kingdom of Italy fought on the side of the Allied powers of France and Great Britain in World War I, declaring war against the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, and Germany in August 1915, October 1915, and August 1916 respectively. Their battlefields were mostly different to the open trench covered battlefields of northern France and Belgium, however. Other than the plains of the northeast, most of northern Italy is rugged mountainous country, and Italy's war on its northern border was one of the most brutal of a very brutal war. Any tank for Italian use would have to not only fill the need to fight in very mountainous terrain, but also in colonial wars in Africa. The British had already deployed tanks in World War I, and so had the French. The use of the Renault FT by France had been witnessed by Italian observers in 1917, and tanks were the crucial element that was helping the British to advance in France. As a result, inquiries were made to obtain a number of both Renault FT and Schneider CA-1 tanks direct from France. In a contract dated 13th October 1915, the Fiat Company had already been tasked by Major General Giulio Martini with the design of a 40-ton armored vehicle with a 65mm gun in the turret and armor superior to an armored car. It is unclear exactly how much was done to fulfill this contract until the end of 1916, after the British had used tanks. But the requirement for such a vehicle so soon after entering the war was an indication of the commitment to the war effort and the faith in Fiat to create a machine to help win the war. It is unknown why this requirement had been delivered so soon after the entry into the war, but it could be speculated that it resulted from seeing the battles already fought on the Western Front, or as a result of a sharing of information from its allies, Britain and France. By the time a design was ready by Fiat, though, official interest was being shown in the French tanks instead. The Fiat design, from the pen of Carlo Cavalli, a technical director at Fiat, and Giulio Cesare Capa, formerly a car designer at Aquila, famous for racing cars, was finally ready in January 1917. This design, under the original contract, was Automobile Blindata di Assalto Tipo 2000, and this design from Fiat was instead to now be commonly known as the Fiat 2000 although at least one blueprint refers to it as a mobile fort. Design and construction caused a lot of friction between the two industrial giants of Fiat and Ansaldo. The project was very expensive, and Ansaldo did not have a formal contract from the army for production of the armor plate used. This armor was to be the best available at the time, high-quality vanadium armor plate from the Ansaldo works at Tierney, which had originally been destined for the warship Cristoforo Colombo. Whatever the exact details of the dispute were, it was resolved by Mario Peroni. The armor would be supplied by Ansaldo and assembled at Fiat San Giorgio plant in Ceste Levante. Prototype vehicle number one was still incomplete by June 1917 when it started trials. Only the hull was complete, and it was still lacking the upper structure, which constituted the fighting compartment of the tank. Unlike contemporary British tanks, the Fiat 2000 did not use the all-around track, but instead a more conventional track run going around two large diameter wheels at each end and protected by armor over the sides. Drive from the rear mounted engine was taken to the front via longitudinal transmission shaft which drove the front sprockets by means of a chain drive. Cooling was by means of air drawn in through a large radiator grill at the back. The second vehicle would not be completed until February of 1918. The vehicle layout was simple but effective. The lower section comprised the engine, transmission, and all of them running gear. It was divided by a bulkhead from the space above. 
This unusual construction also had the advantage that it kept the engine area sealed off from the crew space. This was very advantageous from the perspective of reducing the risk of smoke intoxication of the crew and safety in a fire and allowed the vehicle to be made in separate facilities and then put together later. Prototype number one received a flat top round turret and it was not known when this was switched to the distinctive dome shaped turret. Prototype number one can be distinguished from number two by the construction of the armored skirt on the lower half. Prototype number one had a multi-piece armored skirt, whereas number two had a single piece skirt. The upper sections and number of openings were also different, and crucially, the guns at the front and back are in the corners on number two, but only in the front and rear faces respectively for number one. For the turrets, the second prototype vehicle seems to have gone straight to the dome style turret. In video footage of the Fiat 2000 prototype number one during trials, she can be seen climbing a stone step the height of its own tracks, and at the end, indications that the original flat top turret was just a mock up as it appears to come loose. The driver sat in the front center of the tank in a bulbous nose, which afforded a very good view of the route ahead via a periscope or from the large hatch, which could be open to improve visibility and airflow. Access to the fighting space was by means of a large door on the left side of the fighting compartment, and the plans and photographs show what appears to be a circular ventilation fan in the front left-hand side of the vehicle on number one, another feature sorely needed on World War I tanks. At some point, a multi-tone camouflage pattern was applied too. The large boxy structure of the vehicle was made from 20 millimeter thick armor plate as described before, with only the rear of the tank being thinner at 15 millimeters. This armor thickness was low by World War II standards, but in World War I, this was more than sufficient for any machine gun fire or even the German anti-tank rifle. Large skirts made from the same material covered the whole suspension arrangement of four sprung bogies on each side and the tracks. One additional note is that prototype number one has small sections covering the bottom part of the large wheels at each end. The purpose of these is not known, but they are not present on vehicle number two and appear to have been removed from vehicle number one later too. The machine was still very large, too large in fact to be ideal for use in the Italian mountains and very heavy. The Fiat 2000 had a mass of 40,000 kilograms making it significantly heavier than the British tanks and even the German A7V. Despite this large size, the fighting compartment was still cramped, although not as cramped as other tanks of the era. The fighting space was perched on top of and around the mechanicals with space for the crew. A crew of up to 10 men is sometimes quoted in order to man all the weapons, but eight is more likely due to the space considerations and that not all the weapons needed to be manned simultaneously. The difference may also stem from the variations in fighting space arrangements from vehicle number one to vehicle number two, with fewer fighting loopholes. Unlike its far more cramped British counterparts though, most of the crew could, in fact, operate the weapon standing, rather than in the very uncomfortable semi-squat position needed to operate Sponson guns on the British designs. For armament, the original Fiat 2000 was bristling with firepower. Up to eight machine guns could be mounted in the various portholes in the sides, but the main gun was fitted into a small dome-shaped turret mounted on the roof. The low round turret from the prototype, which likely only suited a machine gun, was gone, and this much taller dome turret provided far more room for a cannon. One source claims that a 14 mm heavy machine gun was suggested for the design during development, which could be the answer to what was intended for the first turret, but there is insufficient information to say for sure either way. Major Alfredo Benicelli seems to have been pushing for a 75 or 76 mm gun for the turret, and in May 1918, it was suggested instead to select a 77 mm cannon instead. In the end, it was the 65mm mountain howitzer which was selected. 
The selection of a howitzer and the unique turret design would permit the Fiat 2000 to not only fire direct, but also at a high angle as a howitzer. The drawback being a large dead spot close to the vehicle, which the main gun could not cover. This was a gun more than capable enough to fulfill the functions of the tank for assaulting enemy positions or providing fire support for attacking troops. The 65mm Turin Arsenal M1910 M1913 mountain gun was in good supply, had armor piercing and high explosive shells as well as shrapnel rounds available to it at the time, making it an ideal weapon to select. The number of Fiat 2000s has been subject to conjecture for nearly a century. Some sources state that as many as six vehicles were ordered, and the first edition of Der Takenbuch der Panzer by Heigl states that as many as ten were either intended to be made or in some state of production. An examination of the production records, however, shows that only two 65mm guns and 20 machine guns were ordered for the project which suggests that only two vehicles were ever planned. Either way, it was the adoption by Italy of the French Renault tank which killed the Fiat 2000. Just the two examples of the Fiat 2000 had been finished before production of them was officially discontinued on 4th of November 1918. Any remaining parts which may have been around or for a future production were scrapped at this time. Fiat did not need to make more of them anyway. The Renault FT contract had gone to Fiat, who went on to manufacture them under the name Fiat 3000. Fiat had managed to produce a rival to the design which they won the contract for, so effectively had managed to guarantee that they would get to build the tanks for the Italian army. Despite the project falling through, the Fiat 2000 still entered service. Prototype number two was sent to the front lines in 1918, presumably for trials in the sort of terrain so common in the Western Front, but it is not known to have seen combat. In service, it was known as the Fiat 2000 M1917, but the M17 part seems to have been retrospectively applied after modernization of one of the vehicles was done in 1934. Despite having appeared too late to see combat in World War I, Italy had colonial possessions to take care of. The modern-day nation of Libya had been taken by Italy after the Italo-Turkish War of 1911, and post-war, there were a series of Arab revolts against Italian colonial rule. At least one of the Fiat 2000 tanks was dispatched to Libya to bolster forces there as part of No. 1 Bateria Autonoma Cara de Salto in the early 1920s. The only known account of their combat use comes from Le Forze Armate, stating both vehicles were dispatched as part of an armored force to reconquer Giarabu, a strategic oasis about 240 kilometers south of the port of Bardia. One vehicle is alleged to have broken down at Porto Bardia, and the other some distance from action, leaving the actual battle to be carried out with only Fiat 3000s and a variety of armored cars and trucks. Other sources disagree, stating only one of the tanks ever went to Libya. Colonel Perezzini states that one of the Fiat 2000s was dismantled in Benghazi prior to 1935 for unstated reasons, but if it was true, then probably due to a lack of spare parts. Whether they saw any action elsewhere in Libya is not known at this time, but the late Libyan dictator, Colonel Gaddafi, put them on his stamps in action. As of an army inventory conducted in 1925-26, and 26, only a single Fiat 2000 was shown, so certainly by this date one vehicle had been decommissioned or scrapped. The last known photograph of number one is dated March 1924. As the only vehicle appearing in photographs after 1925 and 26 is the number two vehicle, it seems that number one was scrapped. Photographic evidence can definitively show vehicle number two was in Italy afterwards, though lending credibility to the theory that both tanks were sent. At least one of the Fiat 2000s was used post-Libyan rebellion for various propaganda purposes. 
especially after the fascist government of Benito Mussolini came to power in Italy in 1922. The vehicle was used for training purposes too, and reappeared in 1934 as the M34 version. This version retained the dome turret, the 65mm howitzer, and at least four machine guns, but the front had been modified. Instead of mounting two machine guns in the front corners, it now mounted two 37mm L40 anti-tank guns instead. From the identification features, it seems that this was also number two. By the start of World War II, the last remaining Fiat 2000 completely disappears. Sadly, probably just scrapped and salvaged for the war effort. At 40 tons, it was the heaviest tank produced in Italy for nearly 40 years. La Stampa reports that it was the last known to be in a foundry at the end of World War II, although its last public sighting appears to have been in about 1939. The first vehicle probably never came back from the campaign in Libya, if indeed it ever went. No photographic evidence has been located confirmed that vehicle number one went to Libya, or even of the vehicles at all after 1918 or 1919. The Fiat 2000 was undoubtedly large, but was probably the most powerful tank built in World War I. No trace of either the Fiat 2000's remains today outside of the original wood construction model, blueprints, and photographs. Italy's first indigenous completed tank was one of its largest and suffered from bad timing. Too late to make any difference in the war for which she was built, unable to make a difference in the colonial wars, and then too outdated to be of any use for World War II. The Fiat 2000 remains one of the most distinctive tanks ever built, a unique design, and one which showed the independent design skills of Italy in tank design and manufacturing. In 2017, the original 1 to 5 scale Corello model was purchased by an Italian organization called Spa Militare at auction with a plan to manufacture a full scale reproduction for an estimated cost of 700,000 euros. The intention of the project is to reproduce an important piece of Italian military and industrial history. Eventually, it is planned to commercialize the vehicle for rentals, films, and exhibitions, help finance the restoration and rebuilding of other old Italian tanks. Tanks Encyclopedia has been working with this group to share information and resources to assist them. And if readers wish to help, they can email the group inbox at the link posted below. That's all for this report. Make sure to follow our website. We'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. If you use Discord, there's a link to our community server in the description. And if you'd like to help us to continue and develop and expand, consider donating on Patreon. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. I'm Nathaniel. And until next time, keep us in your sights.